me and other on the Zoom call today. Um, today we're going to uh, like to call the to order the Burke board work session on uh, Wednesday, September fourth. Um, and I will go down the agenda item. Um, is there any public comment? Madam Chair, I do not see any hands raised at this time. Okay, thank you very much, Melinda. Um, we're moving on to the summary of August 7th, 2024 board work session. Are there any questions or comments for from the summary? Quiet group. Thanks very much. We'll move on. Sheila, I'm going to turn it over to you for the regional housing needs profiles. Thank you very much for being here tonight with us. Hello, and thank you, uh, Vice Chair Whitlow. So happy to be here this evening. Um, we're excited to share a new tool that's been developed as a part of the Regional Housing Needs Assessment. Almost three years ago, the Dr. Cog Board set on a very visionary path, yes, visionary, I'm calling it, um, to explore a challenge that spanned all local jurisdictions, namely housing affordability. After strategic discussions, we determined that it was important to start with a regional assessment to understand the scale and the scope of housing need across the region. Hey, At the doc oh, Sheila, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry, Doug here real quick. Is Can there a you... slide presentation to go with this? There is, that will pull up in just a moment. Oh, is okay. that okay? Yeah. All right. I just wanted to okay. make sure. Thank you. All right. Sorry Thank for you. Button in. No, um, great. I'm glad that somebody's helping me out. So at the board meeting in July, we had a wonderful presentation by our consultants for the Regional Housing Needs Assessment that included an overview of the final report and findings. And as you heard during that presentation, the assessment included tremendous data analysis. So in addition to the final report, our consultants have created a data dashboard that includes this data analysis. I'm joined this afternoon with my colleague, Corey McGinnis. And I believe Corey's going to pull up the presentation. Corey is a part of our data science and analytics team. And in addition to providing a demo of the data dashboard this evening, Corey will remind us of the methodology of the regional housing needs assessment and our tensions with the assessment to really assess housing need regionally at a scale that really corresponds to housing markets. The assessment, and also you'll see on the data dashboard, then took the analysis to smaller geographies, namely the sub-regional markets and local jurisdictions. The intention is not an exercise in assigning responsibility for, for each housing unit. It's really rather an intention to understand what it might look like to meet this need across our region. One other thing I wanted to keep in mind before we jump in, um, you had the opportunity to hear from Casey McPherson, who's a part of the Department of Local Affairs, um, recently about the recent uh, laws that were passed related to housing planning. So our hope is that this tool is just one way that Dr. Cog can continue to support our member governments as they look at compliance um, for those new housing uh, planning and assessment laws. So let's go to the next slide. All right. So our Dr. Cox staff has been very busy introducing this new tool to your staff. We held a webinar on July 31st. We had over 80 participants on that webinar. We then offered office hours for local government staff to meet with Dr. Cox staff, and we had several local governments take us up on that offer. We also presented to the city and county managers on August 8th. And our intention after this meeting is to take the um, Regional Housing Needs Assessment back to the board at a board meeting for full acceptance of this study. We also plan to be posting an RFP for our Regional Housing Strategy in just a few days, and then we hope to kick off that work later this fall. So a lot's happening that is corresponding to what, what you're going to see this evening. Next slide. All right, I'll provide a little bit of foundation and then we'll pass it on to Corey. So every time we've presented on this regional housing needs assessment, we've had a slide like this just reminding us that our housing work is really rooted in our regional planning work in Metro Vision. 
We often talk about MetroVision as being a collective impact approach that recognizes that the actions and efforts at the local, even neighborhood level, help move us forward in really seeing the desired outcomes that we articulate in that plan. And when appropriate, regionally coordinated and aligned efforts will also move us closer to that vision. And our work around housing is really focused on that um, regionally coordinated effort. Next slide. The other thing we keep rem reminding us is that this work, we see it integrating into our overall work at Dr. Cog. And so we're starting with an assessment. We will then move into a strategy and we anticipate this work then integrating into updates in our MetroVision plan and also our regional transportation plan. Next slide. So now I'm going to pass it off to Corey. He's going to dive deeper into the methodology around the regional housing needs assessment and how it corresponds to this data dashboard. Corey, take it away. All right. Well, thank you, Sheila. And thank you all for being here to listen to me tonight, talk a bit about the needs assessment and the dashboard. So first off, just as a reminder, the result of the first stage of this project is that we now have a regional housing needs assessment report, which you all have access to. Um, and we'll share a link to the webpage where you can access that later. First, I'm going to kick us off uh, just going over a summary of our key findings. So first thing, we have built and continue to build housing in this region, but it's still not been enough to keep up with growth or make up for slower construction and past economic downturns. Second, we found that the largest share of our housing need is for housing affordable to those making less than 60% of the area median income. Now, some of that low income housing need is going to be driven by our region's aging population in future years, but we're also seeing trends towards smaller household sizes. And both of those trends are going to require construction of diverse housing types for our population. And then finally, the existing distribution and growth of affordable and diverse housing types has been uneven across the region. Oops. Now I'm gonna spend some time explaining how we derived our housing needs estimates for the region and for the local jurisdictions. So there's a four step process to the project team's housing need methodology. The first is to calculate our total regional housing need. And this number has two components, current need and future need. Current need is split into two buckets, underproduction and homelessness need, where underproduction is the number of additional units we need to address our current population's demand for housing. And that's based on current households, a higher historical vacancy rate that we used to have, and historical household formation trends. Need for homelessness is the additional number of units that we need for homeless individuals and families, allowing for some vacancies. Then future need is the number of additional units that we'll need by 2050 to account for future household growth and a vacancy rate from the academic literature that would support a healthier housing market. Then the second step in this process is to segment our total housing need by affordability level. So we use data on our current and future population to estimate demand for housing at different percentiles of the area median income. And we compare that demand to the supply of housing at different affordability levels. Then our third step allows us to move housing need down from the regional level to smaller geographies. We do so by defining regional housing submarkets that are based on commuting data and demographics from the census. These submarkets are contiguous combinations of public use microdata areas, which is a geography that the census uses. And a key advantage of this geography is that it allows us to use disaggregate census data in our analysis. And then finally, a fourth step is to actually distribute this regional housing need by income down to the submarkets and then down to the local level. And this distribution helps us demonstrate what it could collectively take to meet our regional housing need. So here's what those numbers look like. Looking from 2023 to 2050, we estimate that the region will need to produce just over 511,000 new units over the period to meet current and future demand for housing. But while we start with an estimate through 2050, we also want to look at housing need over a shorter time horizon. A 10-year need estimate might have more relevance for developing a near-term housing action plan. And over this period, 
we estimate a current and future need of 216,000 units, where that current need stays at the same number, 52,000 units. And now we'll look a little bit at the distribution of this need by income. So just to understand what's going on in this chart, the outline of these orange bars presents 10-year demand for housing by income level. And the shaded area presents our current supply of housing affordable to each income level. So the gap in each of these bars is our housing need by income, which you can see is largest for units affordable to households making less than 60% of the area median income. That's those left two bars. But as you can see across the income distribution, there's still need for more housing. And so this is a big picture view of our housing need at a regional level, but our next step is to distribute this down to smaller geographies where we can see what meeting our total need could look like at the local level. So as I mentioned before, first we distribute need down to the submarket level, and then from the submarkets we distribute need down to the local level. Here you can see a map of those submarkets on the left. There are five of them, a west, north, north central, central, and southeast submarket. And in the dashboard I'll be presenting later, you'll see a different version of this map where it's a little easier to tell um, where each of these submarkets are landing. And then on the right side, you can see a table that has a list of all the different jurisdictions landing in the different submarkets. And any jurisdiction with an asterisk is one that's split across multiple submarkets. So for example, in the top row, you can see that Arvada has portions in the north north central and west submarkets. And it's important to note that this geography we're using for the submarkets, public use microdata areas, they don't always follow jurisdictional or county boundaries. So that's why some of these communities have to be split up in our analysis. And now I'm just gonna give a high level summary of the criteria we use to distribute our 10 year regional housing need down to the submarkets and local communities you saw on the last slide. So there are current metrics that we use to distribute that current need and future metrics used to distribute the 10 year future need. These metrics include population and employment, which have a direct connection to housing demand and pull in Dr. Cog's small area forecast. There are metrics of multimodal accessibility based on our current and planned regional transit network, as well as data on short commute times. And then finally, we have metrics derived from sub-regional housing affordability and vacancy rates. Only the population, employment, and transit metrics are used for our local need distribution, while all of the metrics are gonna factor into the sub-market distributions. And the reason for that is that data for those other metrics are not available at the local community level. So now I'm gonna jump over to this dashboard. Here, I'm gonna walk us through how you can access this, understand the dashboard um, and see local need in your community. So it'll just take one second while I get this up on my screen. And that should be loading just now in one second. Great, so here it is. We're gonna start here on this welcome page, which explains how you can use this dashboard to explore estimates of local housing need that are distributed down from the regional and sub-regional level as we've just discussed. And this page also reiterates something Sheila said at the beginning of this presentation, that these local estimates are not housing targets that each municipality must achieve. Rather, we really hope that local governments can use these estimates to help understand what housing need looks like in the region and to see what meeting our regional need could look like at a local level. So first, I'll take us over to the submarkets tab at the top of my screen, and we'll start with this map, which I mentioned earlier. And here you can see the region split into five submarkets and overlaid with all the jurisdictions. So you can use this info to understand where a jurisdiction fits into the needs assessment, which is important based on the way that we distribute need down to local jurisdictions from the submarkets. If I deselect the jurisdictions, you can see these submarkets a little better. There's a West Market, North Market, North Central, Central Market, and a Southeast Market. And then if I turn the jurisdictions back on, you can zoom in and see just how uh, these jurisdictions overlap or don't with different submarkets. 
So for instance, Denver is entirely in the central submarket. But if you look at a place like Golden, that's actually going to be split across three submarkets, the West, North Central, and Central submarkets. We also have the same table here that we showed you in the presentation where you can see these uh, jurisdictions listed out by submarket, and then also a short page of documentation explaining what the submarkets are and how they're defined. Now I'll take us over to the local needs tab. And this is gonna show our 10 year local needs by income for each of the five submarkets. That's gonna be the default when you open up the dashboard. So just to understand this chart, if you look at the label to the right of the bar, that's gonna show the total housing need for the entire submarket. And then each of these different colored segments are gonna break out that need by affordability level. And those labels are down at the bottom of the screen here. So for example, the top bar is showing that our 10-year need estimate for the central submarket is 70,000 units. And then the furthest left dark blue segment indicates that about 25,000 of those units should be affordable to households making between 0 and 30% of the area median income. The next segment to the right shows the number of needed units affordable to households making between 30 and 60% of the area median income, and so on. And so while the dashboard defaults to presenting these needs estimates for the submarkets, you can also use the drop down on the left to select local municipalities. So I'm going to clear our current selection and show you how to find your own municipality in this drop down. I'm going to start just by selecting the largest municipality in each of our submarkets. So that's going to be Aurora in the southeast submarket, Boulder in the north submarket. Denver in the central submarket, Golden in the west submarket, and Thornton in the north central submarket. Um, you can also, if you'd prefer, use the search function here. And the other thing that you might notice if you've seen a previous version of this dashboard is that we now have county and unincorporated county local needs estimates so that you can find those. And so Going back to this chart, now that we have these five jurisdictions selected, you can see, for instance, in the top bar, looking at Aurora, that we're estimating a total need of about 27,000 units, and that almost 20,000 of those units should be affordable to households making less than 80% of the area median income, and I'm getting that by adding up these three bars on the left. So if you want to dive in deeper to what all this means, how we got these numbers, we have this documentation tab explaining how we get our local needs estimates and how they're broken up by affordability to different income levels. And then beyond providing these local need estimates, we also wanted to provide a little context around why we have so much housing need in the Denver region. And so the last tab in the top bar, Key Trends, has a series of charts that are going to help tell that story. We'll start with the first tab, housing burden, and this is showing the share of cost burden renter households for each of the selected municipalities in the years 2000 and 2022. The golden portion of the chart, as you can see in the legend here, is going to show the share of renter households spending more than 30% of their household income on housing costs. And the coral portion is going to show the share of renter households spending more than 50% of their income on housing costs. You can see across all these communities and really the whole region, if you're to select any of them, the increase in housing cost burden over the past 20 years and large absolute shares of burdened and severely burdened renters really underscores the need for a regional strategy to improve housing affordability. Next, we have a tab on permitting trends, which shows the number of units permitted by municipalities since 2000. These unit counts are broken out by type of permit, so you can see how many new units have been, for example, single family homes, duplexes, or large apartment buildings. So for example, you can see that in Denver, most of the units permitted over the past few years have been for large multifamily structures. And you can use this tab to better understand the amount and type of housing that's been built across the region over the past few decades. We also have a tab for current supply, which just shows the total number of housing units in each municipality according to recent census data. And then the last two tabs here are going to come from Dr. Cog's small area forecast. The first shows projected household growth through 2050 by municipality, 
and the second shows projected job growth through 2050. And these forecasts are driven by the State Demography Office's own household and employment forecasts, which tell us that while growth is slowing, we can expect a lot more people to live and work across the region in the next 20 to 30 years. So it's really important that as a region, we're forward thinking and address our housing needs with future growth in mind. We also have a documentation tab here where you can learn more about the data sources that we used for each of these key trends charts. And then finally, we have one last tab, which is designed for a more technical audience that's interested in diving deeper into how our local needs estimates are determined for each jurisdiction. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this tab, but I'm happy to answer questions after my presentation is over. For those who are interested though, this chart is showing or it's tying into our local distribution criteria to the actual housing need in each municipality. So you can see the percent of need that's attributable to each of these different metrics, jobs, population, and transit access. So I would highly recommend that anyone really wanting to understand this chart and our methodology, read the associated documentation tab, how is housing need distributed down, which defines each of these metrics and provides an example on how to interpret the chart. And then finally, there are two last features I want to show you. At the left of the screen here, there's a download data and a download PowerPoint tab. You can click both of those and I'll show you what that looks like when you access those downloads. So first there's this housing need Excel file, and that's going to show you the data backing up each of these charts that I walked through in the dashboard. And those charts are going to be specific to the jurisdictions that you've selected. And then second, it's going to create a PowerPoint that's going to populate it with all these same charts specific to the jurisdictions you've selected. So here you can see, for instance, that table of submarkets and jurisdictions, local needs, housing cost burden, permitting, current supply, household and job growth, and then our distribution criteria. And so that's all I have to share on this dashboard. Thank you all for taking the time to listen to this presentation and follow through with me. And now I think we'll turn to questions. Thanks, Corey. Thank you, Sheila, very much for this opportunity to get all this information all in one package. I know you guys will work really, really hard. So I'll start by what I see on the screen is Mr. Kevin Flynn. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Corey, for all this data. I feel like my brain is swimming in numbers which of course uh, should be expected because of you know how deeply you know, you've gone into these numbers. I'm just curious, a very basic question, a quick question before any others jump in. And, and my question after probably the rest of them would seem kind of insignificant, but I represent a district in Denver in the far Southwest corner that kind of looks like, I, I tell people it looks like I stepped on a spider on the kitchen floor. It's got all these tentacles. It could, I got a little arm that goes out into Jeffco. I got part into, Rappel County, I border seven jurisdictions. So how, and I know that these are projections, these numbers are projections, not precise, but I'm curious, how do you, how did uh, the study assign housing needs to areas that are intertwined with, you know, seven other jurisdictions? How, how did you apportion these numbers among Denver, Lakewood, unincorporated Jeffco, Littleton, Englewood, Sheridan? Yeah, yeah I think that's Go ahead, Corey. Oh, yes, yeah, yes. No, def definitely happy to explain that. So the way that this distribution is working once we have need at a submarket level. So for instance, um, a submarket is going to include like the central submarket, which is going to include both Denver and Lakewood has to apportion need between those two communities. And right. so all of those criteria that I mentioned earlier, we have data on those at the census block level, which is gonna be really granular. And then we're distributing need uh, in effect to the census block level and then aggregating that up to the jurisdiction. So if, if I could say, add, is it possible to see that at the census block level, those numbers? Those are not numbers that we've made public in this dashboard, but in effect, like, yes, there is, there is a like criteria waiting for each block, and then those are going to be summed up to get need at a jurisdiction level. 
Thank you. I would love to see that if it could be shared. I'm, I'm hoping that it can be shared. The reason I ask is the city has launched the very first land use transportation plan for Southwest Denver, and it covers my entire district. So it'd be nice to have a granular uh, understanding of how they were apportioned. If that's possible, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Oh, Director Kondo. Thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, my question, and maybe this is uh, patently obvious to everybody else, but I, I'm just curious. So if we're projecting into the future, you know, clearly salaries and wages are going to inflate. And I'm just wondering if uh, there was any reference or pointing to that increase or uh, climbing AMI over time. Um, was that component built into this analysis? Well, I think for for our purposes, we're we're looking at income that's like indexed to our base year of 2022. So in terms of like any sort of inflation, that should sort of de facto be captured, but we're not necessarily accounting for real economic growth. Um, and I don't know if other people on the team would have context to add to that. Yeah, we have a few more of our team on the call as well. I don't know if, Zach, did you want to add anything to that? Probably not. Thank you, Corey. So I guess the point being that it is a snapshot in time when it comes to AMI, and I'm, I'm just trying to pick at this a little bit. There may be some weakness in the analysis if we're not accounting for the increase in salaries and wages over time. Yeah, and I might, might rephrase that. I'm not sure there's a weakness in the analysis. This is a national methodology just being used across the country in order to understand the need in terms of housing units. And then the analysis around income level is supposed to give us a, uh, in, in a sense, a, a uh, I get a perspective on what, where those units should be. The other piece that we didn't go into great depths into, but it was a part of one of our early um, reports from our consultant, was looking at housing costs um, according to current wages and how wages haven't kept up with housing costs across the region. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think for our purposes, it was not necessarily that we wanted to get to that precise number. It's more to give us a glimpse of, okay, when we talk about housing units, what kind of housing units are we really, should we be looking at based on what we know about incomes at this time? Rich, you're, <clears throat> you're muted. Oh, sorry. Uh, as you were explaining that, uh, Sheila, I just realized maybe it is a standard methodology because you wanna be able to compare apples to apples. So <clears throat> thank you. Thanks. Director Martinez. Oh, yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you know, I, one thing that I'm not 100 percent clear on uh, is the interaction between the, the job factor and the, the population forecast. Uh, so so, you know, for example, on, on the chart, on one of the charts, you've got, you know, the attribution for each of the different factors. I'm looking at the north total, for example. Um, so it says, you know, four percent. Of the if the need is attributed to current jobs, eighteen percent to future jobs. So my my question is, um, how how does the job, like what is this concept of jobs and housing needs? Are are we looking at the need for, um, like housing near jobs? I mean, because the way I understand it, the reality is is that people work all over the place, and so um, someone. I'm not clear on the connection between having housing need to a job in the same submarket or the same jurisdiction. You know, someone can live in Thornton and work in Denver or anywhere and vice versa. So I'm just I'm just uh, 
interested in that. And the same kind of goes to the 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 transit access. I'm not really clear on on what that impact of transit access is on on housing needs. So could you explain that a little bit in more detail? Yeah, I'm happy to take a pass at that. So I think first thing is that when we're when we're defining our submarkets, we're using data on commuting patterns. So we're actually trying to create submarkets that have a large number of people who live and work in the same subregion. But obviously you're correct. There are going to be people who live in one subregion and commute to another. But we're sort of using that for a pro proxy of here's one way that we could get our sort of regional planning goals aligned and get more jobs closer to housing if possible. Um, as far as how each of those metrics are used, the idea here was just to create some different weights where we could get down from that regional number to uh, local numbers in a reasonable way. And one of those ways was to think that areas that are gonna have a lot of population, those are gonna require housing, and then potentially areas that are gonna have a lot of jobs, it could be beneficial for um, housing to be built that's accessible to those jobs. But again, this is just one distribution criteria, and this is not the end all be all of how housing needs gonna be distributed. Um, which again gets to why these are not targets for any one community to meet. But this was one way that in working with our consultants, we were trying to think of a sort of reasonable allocation to get these numbers at the local level. Is the theme true for the, the transit? Um... Yes, sorry about that. Yeah, the same, the same being true for transit, that ideally to meet our regional planning and transportation goals, we would like to have housing that is accessible to our transit network. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Director Spear. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for the presentation. And uh, I just wanted to commend the documentation. It's really helpful. And I love being able to download the PowerPoint slides and kind of get uh, individual information. So thanks for those features. Um, I had a couple of questions just around the, um, the dashboard itself and the data and everything, and then a couple of questions that are a little more general. Um, and so um, maybe Vice Chair, you can let me know if it's better to do one, what one set uh, later, the more general questions. But for the more specific ones, um, one of the things I was wondering is then the estimate of current need, um, did that include things that are in the permitting stage or sort of where, where did that cut off in terms of, um, of what we're accounting for in the current uh, housing units that we have within our communities. Yeah, so that's going to be based on recent census data. And so the most recent data available to us is for 2022. So anything past that's not going to be included in there. And that's why when you see our future need, that's looking, that's starting in 2023. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. So if there were even something that were in the permitting stage in 2020 would not be included um, in these data. Is that correct? Like, yeah, like that, multifamily uh, development or something like that. Yeah. yeah, that is correct. That may not be included. Okay, thank you. That's that's helpful. Um, and then my other question was, um, it, from from what I'm understanding, you're saying, you know, this really shouldn't be taken as um, what an individual city needs to create. And I, it sounds like, though, at the submarket level, um, that is where it's more, we can take it with kind of less of a grain of salt. Is that, am I thinking about that correctly? So submarket level, we can really get a sense of, you know, this is kind of what we're going to be needing for the submarket. But for me to say, look at Boulder and see um, almost 11,000 units, I shouldn't take it as, oh my gosh, Boulder, we need to, we need to go and build 11,000 units in the next 10 years. Uh, Sheila, you, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I can take it. I can try to take that and then I may lead on you. But I think our intention was because of the nature of our work and that we serve 58 member governments, it would be helpful to uh, distribute, in a sense, this need. What we do realize is that we are using data, some data that's only available at certain geographies, and then we're taking a step to distribute that. So when we say we didn't intend, it's not an assignment per se. Um, 
yeah, the submarket is probably a more clear understanding. With that said, a few of our member governments have already given us feedback that the numbers they see in the dashboard are very close or similar to what they've already um, studied in their local housing needs assessment. So, and again, that was just a few, but so it does seem like it's still helpful, but yes, I, I think the submarkets are probably more sound. Madam Chair, this is this is Doug. Can I chime in on that too? Um, and I think, you know, Sheila is exactly right. And I appreciate the question, Director Spear. Yeah, it, it's it's more of a generation of need right now, right? It was that's why we've been very deliberate about rolling this out the way we have, making sure your staff understood exactly what this is. Um, because we don't want this to be seen as a target. In our minds, we have not had that conversation yet, right? About the allocation of of units in the future. And we do believe, you know, because it, it is a regional housing market, um, it makes sense maybe to have those conversations at a sub-regional level, right? Um, and and have a, a legitimate conversation amongst uh, communities about how that, how that need can be addressed. But it, it by no means suggests that, you know, the 11,000 units for Boulder would have to be built in Boulder, right? It could be unincorporated Boulder County, could be in the neighboring communities, whatever that might be. But um, that conversation from our perspective just hasn't been had yet. And I think it will be part of our regional housing strategy over the next year or so. Thank you. Thank you. No, I appreciate that information. Um, those are my two uh, specific to the data questions. I've got a couple more general questions. Would it be best if I let others go first? Or just sure, just here, go ahead. We have, okay. we have, we have time. Okay, wonderful then. Um, thank you. So I guess just kind of diving into this a little bit more. I mean, one of the questions that I have looking at this, because that's a half a million new units across the region in the next 25 years. And I look at something like Boulder or even our, our broader north, mostly north submarket. Um, and you know, we've got 37,000 units and so many of them have to be in that zero to 30% or zero to 60% range. And um, I know we're getting into strategies <laughs> next year, but you know, what, what do we, do you have suggestions on, I mean, how do we even begin to approach this with our communities in the meantime? Um, and, and sort of what, what happens if we don't meet this need? Because presumably these are the folks who are already on the verge of losing housing. Um, so I, I'm just, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts there just about how to communicate this in a way that's not going to lead to mass panic. Yeah, and I think one of our staff might bring in another aspect that's uh, described better in our final report than on the dashboard around filtering just to kind of give us a foundation of what these needs mean in the context of what our housing stock is now. Zach, do you want to chime in on the yeah, concept so of filtering? I yeah, I'm kind of happy to expand on it. So generally in the in the model, there's this idea that that units will kind of move their way down the affordability ladder. So as new units are built, older units, um, particularly smaller, um, attached and apartments will become more affordable. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that hopefully if enough units are built and the housing market becomes uh, more affordable, um, there, that filtering could happen more quickly because what the consultants saw in the data now is that it's happening relatively slowly. Um, the other piece is that I think more broadly, this model is not explicitly modeling um, kind of the broader macro forces in terms of what happens if uh, more units are built and the, and the prices really come down. Like we don't quite know in this model um, what that will finally look like. So it could be that um, that filtering happens much more quickly. There could also be way more liquidity in the housing market that will, will allow for people to move around the region in a much more efficient manner. Um, I think at this point, until we get to the strategy piece and see the interaction between partially subsidized, heavily subsidized, and market rate, um, it's a little premature to worry too much about how that will happen other than realizing that it's a big number and that that's going to take a lot of ways to tackle it. 
Yeah, thank you for that. That kind of leads directly into my last question, which is um, when we get to the strategies, is it going to include um, things like uh, um, just all the ideas people have out there uh, right now, like subdividing lots, um, condoizing single family homes, um, raising the minimum wage, like all, there are so many different ways of getting to this piece of how we have housing within that um, group. And I was just wondering if, if all of that is kind of within the scope too of, of, of what you'll be getting in the, the strategies. And thank you. Thank you, Director Spear. These are great questions. And I might just add that some of what you're bringing up is something that our advisory group discussed at length in that they recognize that we're likely not going to directly build our way directly to 511,000 units. And so it's going to take a lot of different strategies. In addition, we've talked a lot about units and new units and uh, preservation of existing units was another big piece that came up with our advisory group. So in terms of our strategy, I think our hope is that it goes beyond just construction and production of units. Thank you, Sheila. Director Peck. Thank you. And thank you for the presentation. I especially like the uh, dashboard, um, but I am I have some of the same concerns that Director Spear had when I looked at, look at Longmont. One of my questions is when you were when you did the population uh, growth analysis, did you also take into and I'm sorry if this is I didn't read it in the uh, in all the data that was sent out, but did you take into consideration as our population is aging, the population that is exiting the uh, the world, I guess, um, because. That is, I think, incredibly important that some of the some of these units won't be needed as far as growth does by the time we reach 2050. Um, so can you answer that question first? Yeah, so when we're when we're looking at population growth, we're not just looking at new households that are added to the region, but we are looking at the total change in households and population. Um, so that is going to account for, yeah, people move into the region, people move out of the region, people are born and people die. And so that all is going to be taken into account. So these are total population numbers. And we are, another thing that we are looking at, too, is changing in the income distribution based on an aging population and changing demographics. So that's also being incorporated into these need estimates. Okay, thank you. And I just want to add some of the concerns that I have when we get to strategy is that regardless of what we want, if the banking, um, if the banking um, demographics, I guess, are not there, if they're not lending to developers, if they are asking too much of a down for uh, people to get into housing, then that is a part of the strategy on the other side that is a barrier for us to build a lot. And what we are finding, especially in Longmont, that it is the government, uh, Longmont Housing Authority, that is actually building the lower income housing because we cannot get the developers to build it. It's too expensive. So I, I just always want to look at the other side because we can't solve everything. So thank you very much for the presentation. Thanks, John. Director Barr. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to say how much I appreciate Dr. Cog's staff and all the work that's gone into this. I know my city's participated in in some of the focus groups, and I will say that the the projections, uh, you know, on the dashboard and the little that I've clicked around it now, um, really do align with our own housing needs assessment in our in our and in fact almost to the hundredth of the house. Um, it's it's pretty darn accurate. Uh, so this is it, it's ringing true for me. Um, and I know it's a stark, I mean, I'm a smaller municipality and I know that's a stark reality for many larger municipalities uh, to, to see. Um, I, I guess I, I have less of a question, more of like a comment or maybe a thought about how this grows in the future or how this model, how we essentially populate it with the necessary data and information um, to, to show change. Because I think that's the thing that I'm most interested in is you know yes we've got this dashboard it is a 
uh, not necessarily a snapshot. It obviously does future growth projections, but to, in order to, re you know, rectify it and create a better model and true it to the economic conditions, like what our demographic changes are, um, I would say, you know, does this, does the system that as you have it set up now, will that be the same system that we can essentially as individual municipalities, maybe on an annual basis, begin to populate to start looking at what those changes are? I think Director Spear noted as well, it's like, yeah, you know, permitted versus planned versus constructed homes. There certainly is a cutoff line. And I think the most beneficial use of this dashboard is, yeah, it, this is good, but the most beneficial use is to see what we all do as jurisdictions to change the odds of the market, right? To see what are those macro trends, regional trends, mountain trends, you know, North Denver trends that are affecting change at the rate that we need to see it. So I guess, Corey, my, my, my shorter question for you is, like, would we be using this similar dashboard and populating that with data in, in years to come? Is that the anticipation or how it was built? Yeah, so this, this dashboard was built by our consultants, but they handed it off to us. And then our team now is managing it. And I've been making updates to it as we've had additional needs. So, I mean, two easy things are one, as additional census releases come out each year, we have the ability to update our estimate of current need. And then as we also update our small area forecast, we can update those future need numbers. Then sort of the missing part in there might be, you know, as municipalities you know specific projects that are being worked on and maybe want those to be counted in need numbers. We currently don't have a way of incorporating that, but I think it's certainly something worth exploring. We, this is a flexible tool and there's a lot of different information we could incorporate and it's, I, I see it as a living document and not some static thing. So we definitely have the ability to build on this to, you know, track our progress in the future, however we see fit. Thank you much. Thanks, Corey. Thank you, Steve. Director Levy. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Um, I'll add my thanks to Dr. Cog's staff for the presentation and the great work. Um, dashboards are, interactive dashboards are really a lot of fun and and it, it's nice to be able to just uh, kind of tool around and see what's there. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, you know, back to the data that informs these projections. And um, I, I think you may have said this, but but I may have missed it, whether um, just the projections on population growth uh, are incorporating not only like the state demographers analysis, but you know, we up in the uh, in Boulder and in the uh, Northwest area get frequent presentations by Richard Wabakund with his group um, out of the lead school of business about job growth, um, job formation. So I'm I'm wondering about opportunities to use other sources of data to figure out what we're likely to see here on population growth and and location. Yeah, right now, this is coming from our small area forecast, which is at least the future need portion is, and that is going to be driven by um, DOLA's population, employment, and household forecasts. Um, there are other things that we use in this forecast to try to get the sort of local uh, distribution of where households are landing better, like we collect a lot of data from sources like Zonda and CoStar on where development's happening so that we can try to correctly place those households in the right areas. But as far as the as far as the population projections go or employment projections, we're currently not um, in the forecast using at sources other than what we get from DOLA. Okay, thanks. Um, well, and that- uh, I'm sorry oh. to interrupt. I, I just wanted to add that we do send out our smaller forecast for feedback from um, city and, and county staff. So there is a feedback mechanism to directly let us know if we've got something wrong in terms of housing and employment forecasts. So we definitely, it's such an important part of the transportation model and this process that um, we keep that pretty open and transparent. 
Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I, you know, a related question I had, um, I think the other people's questions have been getting at this as well is, um, yeah, I, I think we've known for a long time that the greatest need is in the 30% AMI and below and, and adding the 30% and the 60% AMI and below. And one of the reasons for the great, that that is the area of greatest need is that the market will not build it. And so then you're dependent on LIHTC and you know, other sources of public funding, which are very, very scarce. And so we're, we're just not a, we're not building that as readily as the market rate. But, and, you know, another aspect of it is what's the nature of the jobs that are being created? And, um, and do we continue to have a large population um, say in the in the Boulder County area that is working in jobs or for maybe other reasons, maybe reasons of of you know a, a disability or caring for children, caring for elders, you know that are in that that thirty to sixty percent AMI. So you know making sure that we're we're actually looking at what the job opportunities are and the income levels, um, and rather than just assuming a static distribution. I don't know if that's a question or just a statement, <laughs> um, but I'm happy to have a reaction to it. And then I think I just have one more. I, I guess it was a statement. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, the, and then the last thing is, and this I, I think is also to come in the implementation stage. Um, I think we looked at some data early in this process about market you know, just market forces, like how much does it cost to, to construct a unit? And what can be done without subsidies, given the cost of land, the cost of permitting, the cost of construction? So I'm, I've, I've selected, um, oh, my selections changed here, but um, I had selected Boulder County and then all of the municipalities within Boulder County. Um, and, you know, costs are different in Boulder County for construction than they are in other places. Uh, you know, not that we're unique, every place is unique. So will we eventually get an analysis of what can be built by, uh, without public subsidies um, here so that we know where do we need to concentrate our resources that we, you know, Boulder County um, taxpayers approved an affordable housing tax countywide. You know, we where do we need to concentrate those dollars to meet housing needs and let the market take care of the rest? Director Levy, that's a great question. And it's something that did come up in some of our small uh, focus groups, especially um, fo focus groups with developers, home builders. Um, and I think the answer is in this analysis, we, we, we are not, it does not include something like that, but I do anticipate with the strategy, we are going to have to dive a little bit deeper into on really understanding, given these numbers, what really, what kind of uh, even financing structures are going to bring us the type of product that, that different communities need to meet this need. Mm -hmm. So I guess the answer is right now we don't have it, but yes, very important yeah. to be considering. Great, thanks. Yeah, that's all I have. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Claire. Director Douglas. Oh, thank you. Appreciate the presentation. And uh, I'm trying to compare uh, what our, our, our future numbers are. They're, they're like on track, 30-something thousand people by 2032 or so. Um, and then what DOLA did Dola just awarded $40 million for to build affordable housing through the state. And they estimated that um, they have it at 388 rental units, but only 7% of that money that was uh, to build affordable housing only goes towards ownership of units. And Commerce City is unique because we, we boarded Denver and in the South and then by the airport. Of course, we have right to the north and all. But we have a lot of people who are moving to our area to get away from apartments and rentals. They want to they, they be able to have ownership. 
And I see that uh, a lot of our draw for affordable housing, that's the buzzword, is to really to build more rental units. And we're trying to get away from that. Um, we have a lot of people who are who are going to be pioneers here in Colorado who actually want to uh, take ownership. And I'm looking at Dr. Cog to kind of help with that. And, and we really lack transportation in our northern area. And uh, hoping that Dr. Cog could help those cities that need transportation corridor built out. We're, we're not that far from the light rail, uh, the A-line that goes to the airport. It'd be nice if we had a spur from our northern area to that spur. And if if somehow uh, these demographics and, and uh, you know, with the church and everything could really get us there. So I would like to see more added to the metrics that could get cities that are in need of transportation, well, along with the housing and jobs, to actually get to those numbers, are, are even part of that. How, how can uh, Dr. Cog uh, get get cities like Armor City to actually uh, move in that direction? Thank you, Director Douglas. And I think part of what you're articulating is we have this, these numbers through the dashboards, but what then is needed, especially looking at different local communities, what is needed in terms of what kinds of units, whether it be rental or home ownership, and then also um, how, how do we draw on other, um, I guess, needed infrastructure in order to make those or draw people to those units. And I think that certainly... Um, part of the reason we did this analysis was to bring another lens into all the work we do at Dr. Cog. And so our intention, of course, is to use this information to inform other planning projects and planning that we'll do across the region. I don't know, Doug, if you want to chime in on the piece about transportation as well. No, thanks, Sheila. And, and Director Douglas, thank you for the question. I, I really don't have a whole lot to add. I thought Sheila did a good job of that. And you know, it is, it's all encompassing, right? And and um, listen, I think there's a lot of questions to be asked in, in the strategy part as we go forth on this, right? With regarding uh, infrastructure investment and the need for infrastructure in various communities. And to the point that Director Levy made, I mean, each community, each county is unique, right? And having a better understanding of exactly what the needs are specifically around the region, I think makes a lot of sense. I mean, why is, to your point, why is there seem to be an attraction of developers and uh, and contractors in building rental units versus home ownership units? Um, that's a legitimate conversation that we need to have and better understanding that so that we can provide a more diversity, more diverse uh, housing portfolio and options for our the residents of this region. I I think stay tuned on that on that point. So when we get into the strategies, I think that's going to be. Um, pretty poignant conversation. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, um, Director Douglas. Director Kern. Hi, thank you. Uh, lots of really fantastic questions. And uh, and I'll just continue to echo the, the sentiment of what a fantastic job Dr. Cog and, uh, has done pulling all of this information and the, the consultants did pulling all this information together for us. Uh, if it's a lot for us to unpack, I can only imagine what it was to put together. So I, I had a couple of concerning things that one of the things that we found in Louisville in the last three years, um, especially since the Marshall Fire, we lost a lot of people who um, uh, lived in single family housing, a little bit of townhouses. But we found that 120 percent AMI and up is not really where that cap should lie. We found that that 120 to 150 AMI category for family income was still a group of people who are almost at a level of needing assistance, that they almost consistently spend 45 to 50% of their income on housing um, just to maintain living in their current neighborhoods. So my, I worry that we, we look at these numbers and we say 120 AMI and up and we just, and we stop it there versus breaking out the 120 to 150. And it could be the uniqueness of um, Boulder County of Louisville. But uh, but I just thought I would throw that out there that, that that can be a lump of people in today's world that 
um, still cannot afford to have a home. And and honestly, I agree with um, with Mayor Douglas that there. When the more outreach we are doing in Louisville, the more that we hear from younger people, so like under thirty five, that are in that. Um, 40 to 70 AMI category, like a hard group of people that we are trying to really help people who are working in our in our city, wanting like coming in as teachers or park rangers, or they grew up in the community, went to college, have been working somewhere else for five years and coming back. They are willing to scrimp and save and live with roommates. They don't want to rent. They want to own a piece of Louisville. They want to own a piece of Boulder County. And part of it is it's building equity for themselves to grow as a family. And then they are in literally invested members of the community. So I, I would agree. I think that we focus a lot on um, maybe short-term housing needs for the rental or the very, very low income, which it's so heavily subsidized that it, it really doesn't fall into the ownership. It just falls into perpetuity of subsidized you know, rentals, right? Um, but I think if we want to make a difference in a lot of these regions, we have to find a way to have some ownership, whether that is in condos, although that doesn't seem to be where the most people want. They want like townhouses, row homes, um, duplexes, that kind of thing. Um, some of the young people are like, you know, have I've heard from said like a quad or a sixplex. They like some of the things that they see that go into Denver that are new and funky, but live and feel like a house instead of an apartment building, which they've been renting in and living with roommates. They don't want more of that. So if we if we encourage and supply housing that actually people don't want, then are we filling a need? And I, I thought I would just present that as a collective group because I am hearing that in other towns that it doesn't seem to be unique. We just don't talk about it because it's um, maybe not as popular of a conversation, but it's a truth that we need to be able to address. I believe in, in especially in our community, we need to be able to help these working um, younger people who want to invest in communities and grow and grow their own lives. That Then I had one question, not just a statement, but a question when we're looking at these figures, is there a way for us to identify or do you have any projections on how much of the um, zero to 60 AMI category of shortage of housing that we need for a growing senior population? Uh, I feel that addressing senior housing needs is different than addressing like non-senior housing needs. And they, they, they need different things. They want them in different locations. And uh, maybe like maybe closer to medical services and um, easy access to transportation and things, not for a job, but different access. And I didn't know I didn't see anything like that in in the information. Yeah, that's that's correct. That we're just looking at this total total uh, percent of area median income category, and it's it's not broken out by need for different demographics or need for different types of housing, like you've mentioned, rental or ownership. Um, so that's currently not in here. Uh, it's something we could consider exploring though. And also maybe, I think some of those elements may also be included in Senate Bill 174 to look at housing need by some of these different breakdowns. Okay, I, I think that um, for us, it would be pretty helpful to see that. And then I, I just kind of wanted to make a little remark and let Nicole know that uh, Louisville is gonna help you out a little bit We've got a whole bunch of CU faculty and staff housing. <laughs> so that's all, all Boulder workers that are going to be living in Louisville and right by transit. And I'm very excited that that's coming to Louisville and that we'll be able to help you with that. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Judy. Uh, Director Harmon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Chair Mead. Um, pleasure to be able to take in all this great information. I started on the Planning Commission years and years ago, and housing has always been the hot topic as I've taken each role. Um, another just interesting point, I took um, a tour last week and learned all about our housing uh, through HBA and affordability. And unfortunately, so many of our developers who are currently building attached 
uh, dwelling units for purchase within our entire region all set on the bus tour. These are going to be their last units they're building. So I really hope that this tool can help show that we need it and, and it will be uh, purchased. So uh, really excited about having access to a tool like this. Quick question on that, um, on the document, is there a call out for where and when the data was collected? So that might, some of that might be spread across different places. Let me look right now, like on our local needs, I don't believe that it says in the dashboard here when and where the data was collected. Some of that is going to be available in uh, different documents we make available as part of this housing need process. But I can tell you that a lot of this analysis went on around the end of 2023, early 2024. Um, the current need is largely based on 2020 vintage 2022 census estimates. So those were the most recent ones produced last year. And then the future need is based on our version of the small area forecast that was produced in 2020. And our team is currently at work to update that forecast. Wonderful. I just know that will be the first question that's asked, and I just want to make sure it's easily accessible as we're using it. So hopefully by the time my young daughter that's joined this call is old enough to purchase a home, she'll have one to purchase. So <laughs> thank you so much for, for your time. Thank you, Director Harmon. Is there anyone else that would have any questions or comments for staff? Sheila, Corey, Zach, thank you very much for your presentation today. Really do appreciate it. We've been anticipating this for so long. So thank you so much for all of your work. Um, before we adjourn for this evening, um, I would like to remind everyone that you received an email today from Melinda about the Executive Director Performance Review. And all input is due by September 27th. So could everybody just take a few minutes out of their day and do the survey? I would appreciate it. And um, if there's nothing else for the night, I would ask that we be adjourned for this evening and we'll see each other September 18th. Thank you. Thank you.